Senator from Vermont. Mr. President, I ask consent to call the quorum be dispensed with. Without objection. Morning business is closed. Under the previous order, the Senate will proceed to executive session to consider the following nomination, which the clerk will report. Nomination, the Judiciary, Jimmy V. Reyna of Maryland to be United States Circuit Judge for the Federal Circuit. Under the previous order, there will be one hour of debate equally divided and controlled between the two leaders or their designees? Uh, Mr. President, um, and I'd ask consent that however the time is divided that the vote not be later than 5.30. Without objection. Hmm? We'll, we'll, we'll change it if, if you need other. But. I thank the Majority Leader for beginning another work week by scheduling a confirmation vote on an important judicial nomination. The nomination of Jimmy Reyna to the Federal Circuit was reported unanimously by the Judiciary Committee last month. I expect his nomination to be confirmed with strong bipartisan support. I wouldn't be surprised to see him supported unanimously. Of course, this is true also of the other judicial nominations pending on the Senate's executive calendar, including several, for what have been designated judicial emergency vacancies in New York, California, Florida, Tennessee. With nearly one out of every nine federal judicial judges vacant, we should act responsibly to address this vacancies crisis by voting promptly on nominations that are reported favorably by the Judiciary Committee. After this confirmation today, the nominations of another dozen judges and that of the Deputy Attorney General of the United States will remain pending and await Senate consideration final Senate action. Several of the judicial nominations and that of the Deputy Attorney General have been waiting final Senate action since last year. When he is confirmed, Mr. Reyna will become the first Latino to serve in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. He's a past president of the Hispanic National Bar Association. Mr. Reyna has excelled in private practice for 30 years. He specialized in international trade law, very complex, very important part of our law. He was unanimously rated by the American Bar Association Standing Committee in the Federal Judiciary as well qualified to serve in this court. And for those not used to these ratings, that's the highest possible rating uh, a nominee could get. His nomination demonstrates President Obama's commitment to working with senators to select well qualified nominees, and his commitment to increasing diversity in the federal bench. It's appropriate that we are considering Mr. Reyna's nomination in a timely manner. There's no reason it should take weeks and months for the Senate to consider nominees reported by the Judiciary Committee, particularly those who are consensus nominees. Now, Mr. Reyna's nomination is one of 13 judicial nominations currently uh, waiting a Senate vote after being favorably reported by the Judiciary Committee. Two of those nominations have twice been considered. First last year, again in February, both times reported with strong bipartisan support. A Susan Carney of Connecticut to fill a judicial emergency vacancy in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. And Michael Simon to fill a vacancy in the District Court in Oregon. Another has been reported favorably three times with bipartisan support. Jack McConnell, the District of Rhode Island. Another currently pending nomination has been reported favorably four times that Judge Edward Chen to a judicial emergency vacancy in the Northern District of California. Now all of them are long ready for a Senate vote. Vote them up, vote them down. Don't hold them in this kind of 
nominee limbo, uh, where they can't go on with their life, they can't plan. Uh, it's demoralizing to the federal judiciary. It certainly does not reflect well on the United States Senate, a body that I love. Uh, we should vote them, vote them up or vote them down. And we have nominations out pending to fill a judicial vacancy in the D.C. Circuit, a second judicial emergency vacancy in California, judicial emergency vacancies in New York, Tennessee, and Florida, two vacancies in Virginia, and a vacancy in New Jersey. And I expect the Judiciary Committee will consider report additional judicial nominations this week, adding to the number of judicial nominations ready for final Senate action. And we should follow the model we're following today, and I thank both the uh, Democratic and Republican leaders for that, by considering and confirming the President's nomination to the federal bench in a timely manner. President Obama has worked with senators from both sides of the aisle to identify superbly qualified nominees in districts with vacancies. All 13 of the nominations on the executive calendar have the support of their home state senators, Republicans and Democrats. All have a strong commitment to the rule of law and demonstrated faithfulness to the Constitution. And all should have an up or down vote. They have been considered by the Bipartisan Judiciary Committee. And they should be voted on without weeks of needless de delay. We have a long way to go to do as well as we did during President Bush's first term. And I was chairman for a year and a half uh, when we confirmed 205 of his judicial nominations. We confirmed 100 of those in the 17 months I was, I was chairman, and another 105 in the 31 months the President's party held the chairmanship. It, uh, so far, well into President Obama's third year in office, the Senate's only been allowed to consider 75 of President Obama's Federal Circuit and District Court nominees. We're a long way from the benchmarks that Democrats set for President Bush in his first two years in office. So I hope that this today may be a sign that we're going to go back to the way the Senate should act. I would hope we could clear the calendar of nominees before the next recess. And at a minimum, the Senate proceed to confirm those who will be confirmed unanimously. If we join together, we can do that. And I congratulate Jimmy Rayner. Uh, by the time this day is over, he will have been confirmed by the U.S. Senate for a um, seat on the federal circuit. Mr. President, um, I'm going to about to I see the distinguished very distinguished senator from Tennessee on the floor. I'm going to suggest the absence of quorum, because I'd like to speak with him just for a moment before he speaks. I suggest the absence of quorum and ask the time be divided equally. Clerk will call the roll. And without a Mr. Akaka. Be vitiated. Without objection. Uh, Mr. President, it's my sad responsibility to announce that uh, the former governor, Ned McWhorter of Tennessee, has died this afternoon. Uh, Ned has many friends uh, here in Washington, but he has a lot more in, in Tennessee. Uh, what symbolized Ned McWhorter to me was 
a story that occurred to me when I was elected governor in 1978. I was a young Republican, about 37 years old. There hadn't been many Republican governors in Tennessee at that time. The whole state was one party. It was very Democratic. Um, Ned McWhorter was the Speaker of the House. For those who know Ned McWhorter, he was a big, burly, Hoss Cartwright sort of fellow. And he and the Lieutenant Governor, a Democrat, pretty well ran the Capitol. So shortly after I came in, the Capitol Hill media came up to Speaker Ned McWhorter and said, well, Mr. Speaker, what are you going to do with this new young Republican governor? And Speaker McWhorter said, I'm going to help him because uh, if he succeeds, our state succeeds. And for eight years, as he was Speaker and I was Governor, he did that. And the people of Tennessee apparently didn't mind it because after I left, they elected him Governor, and he served for eight years. That sort of bipartisan cooperation was the way I learned about politics in Tennessee. Uh, Ned was a pretty thoroughgoing Democrat. Uh, he was one of President Clinton's closest friends and early allies. Democrats all around our country came to him for his homespun advice. He had no problem working hard during election time to put uh, legislators who were Democratic in the place of Republicans who were already in their seats. That was not a problem for him. But in between elections, he knew what to do. Uh, we would meet in the governor's office uh, every Tuesday morning and we'd go over the issues, the Republican governor and the Democratic leaders. And then we would decide what to do. And if I came up with a better schools program, why the Democrats would come up with an even better, better schools program. So when Tennessee became the first state to pay teachers more for teaching well on a statewide basis in 1984, I made the proposal but it was the result of a bipartisan education commission that Speaker McWhorter and Governor Wilder, both Democrats, and I jointly agreed on. And when the legislature agreed to it, I may have proposed it as governor, but it was amended by the weekly county amendment, which was the home county of Speaker McWhorter. In other words, it was his willingness to fashion a consensus bill on really revolutionary idea at the time reward outstanding teaching by paying them more for teaching well. He did the same thing when it comes to, came to highways and roads. Tennessee had one of the worst road systems in the country in the early 80s. By the time he and I were finished, it had what the truckers called the best. We had three big road programs. We increased revenues to pay for it, so we didn't run up any debt for the state. And in every case, Speaker McWhorter supported and made sure that legislation passed. When we became a state that attracted Japanese industry, he knew that the commitments that I made as a Republican governor, he would fulfill as a Democratic leader of, this, of the House of Representatives, and that he would continue as a Democratic governor. It was a seamless transition. Uh, the same was true with the automobile industry when it began to come to Tennessee. People began to look around for a, a central location with a right to work law and good, good, good working people. And through a succession of governors, Republican, Democrat, Republican, Democrat, we work together to do that. And of special interest it might be to Washington, D.C. right now. Through all those Democratic and Republican governors, uh, we agreed that our state would have almost no debt. That's right, under Governor McWhorter and Speaker McWhorter, our state had almost no debt. If we needed something, we paid for it, and as a result, we have low taxes. Ned McWhorter was one of the finest public servants that I've ever had a chance to work with. Uh, he became a close friend. He had an infectious personality and great sense of humor. The last visits I had with him included the inauguration of the new governor, uh, Bill Haslam. Uh, Ned McWhorter, who is 80 years old, and Jim Haslam, the father of the new governor, are the same age and the best of friends. Their son competed for the right to be the new governor of Tennessee. Uh, governor McWhorter and Jim Haslam, after the election, were the best of friends. That's the kind of person Ned McWhorter was. There are a lot of people in our state who come in and out of politics, and maybe they're appreciated, maybe they're not. Only a few leave a lasting impression. 
Ned McWhorter will be among the very few that leave the most impression. And part of it is his big, burly, infectious, lovable personality. Part of it was his good sense of politics and openness around the state capitol. But a lot of it was his willingness to say to people like a new young governor of the opposite party, uh, I'm going to help you succeed because if you succeed, our state succeeds. Governor McWhorter and I talked many times. I talked with him most recently about a week ago. He was going to see his doctor again to find out whether he said he had a short fuse or a long fuse. Apparently he had a short fuse. Didn't have much life left in him, although he may not have known it or perhaps he did. He used to joke with us and say that the size of the crowd at your funeral will depend a lot upon the weather. And I think what all of us in Tennessee will say to Ned McWhorter is the size of the crowd at his funeral will have nothing to do with the weather because I imagine it'll be standing room only with people pouring out of the back doors. So we're sad he's gone, but it's been 80 remarkable years. A governor who never graduated from college is the governor who had the courage to put into our state law the Sanders model for relating student achievement to teacher performance, helping our state win this administration's race to the top uh, award some 15 or 20 years later. He's made a real contribution to our state. Uh, he's got a big place in all of our hearts. Uh, I'm sad to report that he's gone, but it's an important time to celebrate the life of a public servant whose lessons of how to achieve consensus and still be a good politician would be a good lesson for everyone in Washington, D.C. Mr. President, I yield the floor. I notice the absence of quorum, and I ask that the time be equally divided between the parties. Without objection, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
Our body, the Senate, is going to vote to confirm the 15th judicial nominee for this year. Now, if it seems to my colleagues and to the public that we've been voting on a nominee every week, well, we have been voting on a nominee at least once a week. Both in committee and on the floor, judicial nominees have regularly appeared on the Senate's agenda. We have taken positive action on 34 of the 61 judicial nominees submitted to this Congress by President Obama. We continue to hold hearings every two weeks to examine the nominee's record and to receive testimony. The committee meets every week to report nominees to the floor. So far, the committee has reported 27 nominees, which is ahead of the 23 reported by the same time in the 108th Congress. This demonstrates my commitment, the commi commitment of Republicans on the Judiciary Committee to cooperate with the Chairman to move forward on consensus nominees. Even as we do so, we continue to thoroughly examine the records and the qualifications of all nominees, which is the responsibility of the United States Senate. I would note that the number of judicial nominations and at least one executive branch nomination, which remain on the Senate's executive calendar, are controversial in nature. In other words, not the consensus approach that I've spoken about other nominees to the judiciary. I appreciate the efforts of our leadership to move in a timely manner the nominations which are consensus nominees. Today, we will vote on the nomination of Jimmy V. Renya to be a United States Circuit Judge for the Federal Circuit. Mr. Renya received his B.A. from the University of Rochester and his Juris Doctorate from the University of New Mexico School of Law. After graduating from law school, the nominee served as law clerk for a firm and as an associate at the insurance defense firm in uh, New Mexico. It was in 1981 that Mr. Rania formed his own firm and practiced plaintiff injury, civil rights, and criminal law. He moved then to Washington, D.C. area in 1986 and worked at an international trade firm, eventually making partner of that law firm. Mr. Rania continues to specialize in international trade matters with the firm of William Mullen, where he directs the International Trade and Customs Practice Group and the Latin American Task Force. The American Bar Association has rated this nominee unanimously well qualified. And of course, I'm pleased to support that nomination. The Federal Circuit is unique among the Courts of Appeal. It is not geographically based, but has nationwide subject matter jurisdiction in designated areas of the law. In addition to international trade, the Court hears cases on patents, trademarks, government contracts, certain money claims against the United States government, veterans' benefits, and public safety, safety officers' benefit claims. Of particular interest to me, this court has exclusive jurisdiction over cases related to federal personnel matters. That includes exclusive jurisdiction over appeals from the Merit System Protection Board, which hears whistleblower cases under the Whistleblower Protection Act. And if anybody wonders why this senator said that I had a particular interest in this court and what it does on federal personnel matters is because I've been a long-time advocate for whistleblower protection legislation and have been involved with my colleagues in this body in passing some of that whistleblower protection legislation. I congratulate Mr. Rania and his family on this important <coughs> lifetime appointment. Thank you, Mr. President, and I yield the floor. And I. I suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Okaka.
Senator from Colorado. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that the